I was in Bangalore two days back, sir. Oh, you should have called us. How come? But it was a very short trip. Where my brother is there in. Uh, uh, he's in uh, senior scientist in G. So. Okay. Okay. He he bought a house uh, villa. Okay, so I was there in sir Whitefield area for two days. So oh, yeah. Ajit would have been very close to you. You should have given us one of us a call. Ha, yes, sir. But uh, the uh, schedule was so hectic. I went to for my brother-in-law housewarming ceremony. He bought a villa in Chikkapitirupati area. Chikkapitirupati, yeah. Uh, it's too far. Did, so did you go to I the was... temple? Chikkapitirupati temple. Uh, no, sir. Okay, it's a nice temple actually. Yeah, it's a nice temple. Yes. So I was fully occupied with the family, so okay, that's okay. fine. Hmm. So, so my hospital is very near to the G, the office, man. G, what oh. building or whatever. Okay, okay. Yeah, there is a there is. A, I think it should be very near to the Vaidehi Medical College. I think Vaidehi Medical College. I was staying in that ITC Fortune Trinity uh, Hotel. Okay, okay, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, yes, yes. <clears throat> It was a very nice city, sir, Bangalore. The IT hub is uh, fantastic. Yeah, but it is very uh, crowded, no? That area, Whitefield, lot of. Vinay, can we start now? Yes, yes, sir. Can put the the timer. <clears throat> Hello friends, welcome and good evening in this brand new episode of Jig's Rapid Journal Review. We all know that most of more than 50% of the deaths occurs in, the, in trauma within the first four hours. And the most common cause of death following trauma is hemorrhage. Fibrinogen, as we all know, is responsible for bringing stability to the clot and stability of the clot is necessary to prevent uncontrolled bleeding. Tonight, we are going to present the Cryostat 2 study, a study which investigates the empiric administration of cryoprecipitate, that is, in other words, fibrinogen in patients with major trauma. The, the presentation will be made on behalf of Care Hospital Indore, moderator is Dr. Nikhilesh Jain and presenter is Dr. Kushbu Agarwal. We will also be joined by our expert panelist, Dr. Anand Sanghi from Indore and our regular panelists, Dr. Pradeep and Dr. Ajit from Bangalore. So without wasting further words, we move on to Dr. Kushbu to bring down her presentation. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Anirban Sun. I'm Dr. Kushbu Agarwal from KR Sejal Hospital, Indore. So uh, we'll be presenting uh, the main points of through this PPT. We'll discussing about Cryostat 2. This is the uh, original paper published in JAMA Journal in October 2023. This is early and empirical high dose cryoprecipitate for hemorrhage. I'm not able to see my whole slide, please suggest. Okay. After the traumatic injury. 
So uh, the clinical question goes like, in a patient with trauma and critical bleeding who require activation of major hemorrhage protocol, does early and empirical administration of high dose of cryoprecipitate, cryoprecipitate within 90 minutes of randomization and no more than three hours after injury improve survival compared to standard care? So as uh, Anirban sir has already uh, given an idea about uh, trauma and hemorrhage, how the hemorrhage causes toll in patients that to young people, that to in early hours of injury, trauma is considered as a leading cause of death, specific population being the, uh, young people. And uh, more than 50% of patients with traumatic bleeding die so early in the four hours. The total global hemorrhage burden is estimated to be 1.5 million deaths each year. The acute uh, traumatic coagulopathy have been reported in more than one third of the population before any resuscitation. An acute fibrinogen deficiency may result as a consumption coagulopathy or fibrinolysis or even dilution as a resuscitative measure. And it is known to be associated with poorer outcome. In current practice, Fibrinogen treatment in the form of either cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen concentrate is given to rapidly either correct the levels and whenever it's, it's generally given later in the course of the bleeding. The pilot cryostat trial was uh, found, found that early transfusion of cryoprecipitate within MHP was feasible and is also uh, uh, it can also restore the fibrinogen levels. So let's talk about study design. Uh, Cryostat 2 is a multi-center phase 3 interventional randomized controlled trial. It is an open label and parallel involved parallel groups. The main uh, population involved were at 26 major trauma centers in UK and only one center in US. The eligibility criteria uh, screening was done at all the study center by the trauma team leader and mainly included adults 16 years or older and who have sustained severe traumatic injuries. The study was conducted over a period of, from August 2017 to November 2021. Randomization out of 9036 patients assessed at the, these trauma centers, 2756 were eligible to be randomized, out of which only 1601604 were actually randomized. Majority was not randomized due to unavailability of research team. Out of the 1,604 uh, patients, 799 were randomized to cryoprecipitate group and 805 to standard care group. The randomization one done, was done on 1 as to 1 ratio and it was performed using computer-generated opaque sealed envelope in sequence. The medium time for admission from admission to randomization was 15 minutes. The patient who were included were uh, the uh, patient with the trauma with Injury severity scored median 29 with the evidence of active bleeding requiring activation of local major hemorrhage protocol. The MHP activation at all the trauma centers were included uh, where they showed the systolic blood pressure less than 90 mm of Hg at any point after the admission and who have received at least one unit of any blood component. Where the patients who were exp uh, excluded from the randomizations were those who were transferred from the another hospital, the injuries which were not compatible with the life, and if the patient presented to the uh, study center, when there are more than three hours were elapsed since the injury. So the major uh, hemorrhage protocol was considered to be the standard uh, uh, treatment given to the another group, the standard care group. And in the randomized uh, intervention group, along with the major hemorrhage protocol, an addition, additional three pools of fibrinogen, uh, three pools of cryoprecipitate equivalent to six grams of fibrinogen were given in addition. The standard MHP consisted RBC and FFP. The first pack is consist consisting of four plus four units. And this is followed by the platelet pools transfusion with the second and subsequent second and subsequent packs to achieve 1 as to 1 as to 1 ratio. So the platelets were transfused in the, uh, along with the second packs. And along with the second packs, uh, there was an inclusion of two pools of cryoprecipitate, which is equivalent to 4 gram of fibrinogen. One pool of platelet is 
is equal to the pool platelet concentrate from the four blood donations or any uh, single donor aphoresis platelet concentrate equivalent to that. And one pool of cryoprecipitate was considered to be one which is derived from five single cryoprecipitate donations. In US, uh, instead of RBC and FFP separately, the whole blood was used and which was considered to be one unit of RBC and one unit of FFP each. This is the injury severity score. In short, uh, this was used to assess uh, the uh, patient's severity of the injury. This score consists of the total score from minimum 1 to maximum 75. More than 15 number of score is considered to be uh, having severe injuries, including to severe injury. So the median injury severity score which was used in study was 29. Also, the participant characteristics were well matched in the study uh, in both the groups where uh, median injury severity score was 29, as already mentioned. The number of main participants was also around 80%. A median age of the uh, victims or patients were around 40 years. And the median time from injury to arrival of the ED was 75 in cryoprecipitated group and 77 in standard care group. 80% of the patient had already received pre-hospital transaxamic acid and 43% of patients received uh, uh, pre-hospital blood products. After arrival to the ED, the medium time of randomization was 15 minutes. These are the best baseline characteristics, not in the demographic picture, but also in uh, as far as injuries and uh, physiology on ED arrival is concerned. Uh, they were matched. The systolic blood pressure was around uh, in around 32% patient. The uh, SBP was less than 90 mm of Ag on arrival of the ED. Intervention offered uh, three pools of cryoprecipitate that is equivalent to 6 gram of fibrinogen was given as early as uh, ideally within 90 minutes after hospital administration admission and uh, major hemorrhage protocol activation. 85% of the patient got the cryoprecipitate in the intervention group, whereas 15% did not receive the randomized intervention either uh, because there was no active bleeding or the hemostasis was achieved or the patient died. The median time from cryoprecipitate transfusion was 68 minutes. Whereas in control group, the local major hemorrhagic Pet protocols are activated who received RBCs FFP platelet in the ratio of 1 as to 1 as to 1 along with two pools of cryoprecipitate with second or subsequent pools. In total, 32% patient received cryoprecipitate in the control group. 434 out of 799 randomized patients actually received randomized intervention in cryoprecipitate group, whereas 665 and 785 patients, as already mentioned, Around 85% patient received cryoprecipitate in randomized uh, in randomized interventional group within 24 hours of hospital admission. In standard care group, 32% received cryoprecipitate within 24 hours, but only 9% received the five, uh, first cryoprecipitate within 90 minutes. The median time to cryoprecipitate was 68 minutes in cryoprecipitate group, whereas 120 minutes in standard care group. The outcome measured for the studies were primary outcome, which was all-cause mortality at the end of 28 days. There were another 20 pre-specified secondary outcomes, which included all-cause mortality at 6 hours, 24 hours, all-cause mortality at 6 months and 24 months, the transfusion requirement of all the blood products, including RBC, platelets, FFP, and cryoprecipitate at 24 hours, the critical care and hospital stay outcomes, quality of life measures, EQ5D, FIL versions, and Glasgow outcome scale scores. The safety outcomes measures were symptomatic venous and arterial thrombotic events up, up to 28 days or discharge, whichever was earlier. Post hoc secondary outcome of massive transfusion was also added. The statistical tools used were, uh, the study was designed to de detect an absolute mortality difference of 7% with 90% of power and level of significance of 5% and two-tailed taste. The analysis performed on intention to treat basis and included all the randomized patients. The primary outcome analysis was mixed logistic regression model. 
and survival rate after 28 days were estimated using Kaplan's smear method and compared using Cox proportional hazardous relation. So points which are uh, points to ponder are the primary outcome data was missing for 73 per patients out of 1604 patients, leaving 1531 patients for the analysis. In cryoprecipitated groups, 68% received their first dose of cryoprecipitate within the study goal of 90 minutes after admission. The all-cause mortality for 1513 intention to treat analysis was 25.4% in cryoprecipitated group versus 26.1% in the standard care group. With the odds ratio 0.965 and 95% confidence interval and significance value 0.74. Median time of death from hemorrhage was 191 minutes in cryoprecipitated group versus 86 minutes in standard care group. There was no observed difference for any secondary outcomes and safety outcomes. In pre-specified subgroups analysis, the 36% patients with penetrating trauma, there was a significantly higher mortality was reported in the cryoprecipitated group as compared to the standard care group. This is a primary uh, outcome analysis where the mortality in cryoprecipitated group as well as standard care group was comparable in both the intent to treat population as well as per protocol population. Whereas in injury type, the mortality in penetrating type of injury was significantly higher in uh, cryoprecipitated group as compared to the standard care group. So primary in primary outcome, no difference in all-cause mortality. 25.3% was in cryoprecipitated group versus 26.1%. Whereas there was no difference in the all-cause mortality and secondary other secondary outcomes. Even the safety outcomes did not show any significant dis differences in thrombotic events as well as the rates of myocardial infarction and stroke. To conclude this, in this multi-center international parallel group random, randomized phase 3 trial at 26 major trauma centers, the addition of early and empirical high-dose cryoprecipitate, so standard care did not improve clinical outcomes in patients who were severely injured and bleeding. There were there was no difference in mortality at any time or in secondary or safety outcomes too. Thank you, Dr. Khushbu, for a very nice presentation of a recently published study, which looks into various points and which carries different interpretations. And definitely we are going to discuss more about it as we are going to dissect this study further. So now it's time for discussion. And it's good to start with for me to start with Nikhilesh, who is moderator today for this session. Nikhilesh, when you look into this study from a very neutral point of view, the first thing first, the first thing that you noticed, this is cryostat 2. That means there was a cryostat study which was already conducted and we know that it is a pilot study. Now coming to the, compare these two, in the cryostat original study or the pilot study, they had measured the levels of fibrinogen. Whereas in this cryostat 2, they did not measure this level of... Now, does do you think the measurement of fibrinogen makes a lot of difference and it should have been a part of the study protocol? Absolutely. I mean, when I look at it, the uh, whole cryostat through trial hinges on the fact that one, uh, giving uh, empirical, uh, you know, cryoprecipitate. Now, this becomes a very dicey question. What if your patient uh, is having a normal fibrinogen level? When you're not testing it, there is all the more chances that these patients may end up getting cryoprecipitate uh, transfusions, which are actually unwanted in first place because they were not indicated. So probably getting fibrinogen levels done would have made a lot more sense. So I do not know why like this was pushed through just like that. Uh, when we did not have any, um, you know, sort of levels to actually guide us on that point. Absolutely. You are very right that actually a lot of people with normal fibrinogen must have got uh, administered this drug, although it was no reason to. I move on to Anand. Anand, in this study, if you look into the MHP protocol of 1 is to 1 is to 1, do you think that this is something which is not followed everywhere? In many places, it is 1 is to 1 is to 2. So that it is a particular protocol, the major hemorrhagic protocol, which they followed because of this 25 centers being in UK, which is different from other places, particularly US and Canada, where one is to one is to two is followed. I'm not sure about India, where 
we follow this major hemorrhagic protocol on what what is the prevalence of one is to one is to one or one is to one is to two. But wherever we are administering more platelets, more FFPs, or wherever you are more aggressive with your FFPs and platelets, the need for fibrinogen level, need for fibrinogen or rather cryoprecipitate is less. So does the choice of this protocol makes a difference to the study outcome? Definitely it's questionable because as you said that uh, 1 is to 1 is to 1 versus 1 is to 1 is to 2. And we have seen over a period of time that uh, giving of FFP and platelets have helped and control of bleeding more than the giving of the uh, cryoprecipitate. So definitely it is uh, being a, a major flaw in this study. And uh, we should have uh, in India, as you said, that uh, there is uh, the various centers which don't follow anything. So they just randomly decide on the whims and fancy of the primary consultant and they give just randomly on the basis of the numbers. Coming to your first question with the uh, fibrinogen level as we are not measuring, as this study has not measured the fibrinogen level and overloading such patients with cryoprecipitate can lead to prothrombotic state also because fibrinogen is a pro-inflammatory and prothrombotic marker also. So that may lead to such complications also which should be looked after in this study which has uh, they have not done it. Thanks. Okay, Pradeep, just, Pradeep, to I, add to that, yeah. just to add to that, if you look at the thrombotic rates in both the arms, they have been unusually high. So whether that could have been explained because of the excessive cryoprecipitate or no, that becomes difficult to handle because yes. 13% thrombotic risk is huge. Absolutely. It is a very significant number. Yeah, it is a significant number. And Pradeep, if you see the figures, you will find that one third of the patients in the control group also received ended up receiving uh, cryoprecipitate, which means that 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 there is a definite bias towards the null hypothesis. So, if a lot of patients in the this 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 standard of care group gets get, getting the drug, which is meant for the intervention. Because I think around 68% of patients yes. were administered in the cryoprecipitate group in the intervention arm and around 32% in the control arm. Mm -hmm. So now that that is something very significant because definitely when you have a negative study, it has be, can be for many reasons, but this can be one of the significant reasons. Yes, Pradeep. You are muted, Pradeep. Please unmute yourself. Uh, that's uh, thanks, Anirban. So, congratulations, uh, Kushbu, for uh, excellent presentation. Uh, so, you are right, Anirban. So, in fact, in the limitations, Kushbu can uh, also clarify. The authors do uh, have a submission that there was an overlap of cryoprecipitate uh, between the control group and the intervention group. It was 85% in the intervention, 32% in the control group. So, they do acknowledge that as possible limitation. Uh, and no, no, no. another thing is percent 85 percent it is because they have included the one which have they have got in the baseline because of mhc yeah. if, if you yeah. leave that out it becomes a 68. yeah so and uh, but another thing the author substantiate is in that uh, intervention group they got cryoprecipitate much earlier on so it was 68 minutes and it took double that time in the uh, control group so okay. they do substantiate saying the benefit was definitely more in the intervention group. So that is the way the author substantiated, but yeah, that is definitely one of the limitations on Anirban. Uh, but for Anirban, the whole problem again with this trial, which I think the authors do mention, I think Kushbu also can unmute. We are missing your voice probably because you are, mic is not stable. Internet connection is not stable. Also in the limitation. Is my voice not clear, Anirban? Now it's now it's better. Oh, sorry, sorry. Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, I was just saying, uh, the whole problem of this trial at the outset is uh, even the authors do mention that uh, giving cryoprecipitate MP is not a standard of care anywhere, uh, and uh, and it is not part of hemorrhagic protocol or massive transfusion protocol. A routine empiric uh, administration of cryoprecipitate. So this trial again raises question as to how. It got the ethical sort of a approval for empirical, considering there can be a prothrombotic potential with this. Although they did not find difference in it, but uh, that would yeah, be my observation. That, uh, that they, they even got a waiver of con consent 
for paucity of time wherever it was there and but do you think in, in I, I move on to ajit with that ajit ajit yeah, yeah. is it there yeah ajit yeah, i am here i am here yeah do you think that normally before transfusion we forget about the prothrombi time at least we go look into the inr we look into the other pt and everything other products do you think all this should have all this carry some meaning before we transfuse the blood products yes yes it, it, elastic it, it, tests it, of course uh, doing yeah. the elastography yeah yeah you know yeah obviously see one of the major loop out as you mentioned is that the the you know the fibrinogen level was not not you know not measured that is one thing and if you look at the subgroup analysis you can see that the patient who had a penetrating trauma in fact the mortality was more in people who received the fibrinogen it does not going to help at all though it you know, statistically we can't you know because it's subgroup analysis but though definitely the mortality was more so so maybe as you said some sort of prior you know there should have the, the, these even the this blood product should have been given to the people who are needy rather than you know just give, giving empirically you know there should be some kind of a you know coagulation mar marker should have been there before we administer these products you know so sir, i move on to again once again to nikhilesh nikhilesh well whatever may be the findings although i agree that this is a negative study but if you go into the historically you try to trace out similar studies one was the pamper study in which they had administered thod plasma and they had found that definitely it is going to lower the mortality so when certain studies have already found some benefit which was not demonstrable in this study we tend to look out for the obvious fallacies but can there be fallacies in those previous study which they have probably rectified in this study because this is also a very well conducted study apart from yeah. the this technical issues which we are discussing <clears throat> there was not no loss to follow up the follow up was uh, almost very nice the figures only some 100 patients were lost to follow up in this big yeah. chapter right time yeah nikhilesh okay no, no, okay okay group then uh, there was a significant loss of patient population just because the research team was not available yeah so that has impacted the numbers to an extent that's what i feel another thing when we look at it uh, the type of uh, you know patients uh, the type of patients of groups probably when you look at the figures they were not sick enough to have a mhp protocol or a fibrinogen given to them uh, you know or a cryoprecipitate being given to them routinely thirdly probably lack of a placebo group i do not know though how it is possible it is becomes difficult to have a placebo in these type of settings and uh, when we look at it uh, the timing then the timing of cryo precipitate administration and uh, if you look at it the overlap with the uh, you know uh, timing of uh, cryo precipitate uh, in the standard arm then it becomes you know the sort of the whole study starts tumbling apart absolutely because if you see that the mean duration was 90 minutes and mm. those patients who had received mhp say within uh, the, 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 their in as per their inclusion criteria within after admission of uh, within 120 minutes and subsequently there was considerable overlap that is why you find that the median time was very close between the control arm and the um, and the st study arm now if if even go going by that you, do you think that this patients as as you have rightly said that this patients may not be that sick because a uh, lot of them did not have uncontrollable bleeding and that is why they were not administered to so, add to that in uk there is a standard protocol of giving uh, you know um, tranexamic acid to absolutely. these patients so that also would have contributed in these patients and uh, in addition uh, see if you do not have a placebo then you have a significant number of other variables which can actually contribute to mortality but are not being measured in that way absolutely no, i feel sir i have one uh, can i add one more point yeah yes. please do it actually time for procurement of cryo precipitate was also too much in the study this is one of the limitations of the study that's why the uh, delay was there secondly what i feel the study uh, for the study the thought process was good execution to some extent was good but the planning is, is a flaw they have not planned it well so they yeah. have, that's why there are so much loopholes and they have not reached to any conclusion in this study
anyways, but but Anand, I go come to the another important question that arises in our mind when we go through this study. This study has been particularly for the patients with brain trauma, hemorrhage, etc. A lot of the benefits which have been found is following postpartum hemorrhage. Now, do you think that all the different kinds of hemorrhage need to be actually clustered around their pathologic causative mm -hmm. mechanism and then the idea of transfusion of blood products can be explored would that be a better way no sir it should be individualized uh, uh, which system is involved and the type of bleeding and according to that the decision should be taken that with the, this kind of protocol to be followed or not especially in postpartum hemorrhages definitely they land up in dic most of the time or other health syndrome or whatever uh, uh, mainly in dic so in such you can execute such kind of protocol but in a brain trauma patient, it is difficult to apply such kind of protocols. So it should be individualized rather than clustering in together and uh, uh, as a blind therapy to give all the patients and of trauma and bleeding patients. Yeah. No, so Pradeep, can I add to it? Can I, can yeah, I add to yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. Basically, we did not go ahead and uh, used any bleeding scores to ensure some form of standardization. If we would have used, then probably we would have seat belt. improved. And in addition to that, we are talking about a heterogeneous population. So with this heterogeneous population, you have very broad inclusions. How much sense would that have made in a this sort of heterogeneous population? Becomes difficult. They all thought about early intervention. Again, MHP in the control group is variable. And now, if when puts uh, uh, you know cryo precipitate, then it further confounds the study. No, no, one thing you have interesting thing you have pointed out about the bleeding scores. I want to go to Anand once again for that. Anand, do you think that practically it is possible to follow any bleeding score all these times, although it sounds good in the setting of a research? But do you think practically a bleeding score is a good idea to follow and to practice? Or is it in that the, in the setting of acute emergency where the patient is bleeding who is hemodynamically unstable? Not the uh, uh, bleeding score definitely it's a good idea, but it is very difficult to measure at that point of time when the patient is bleeding. The relatives are after you, and the patient is in shock. The only thing of my thought uh, comes to one's uh, doctor's mind is to give the blood and blood products or do a tag or uh, fibrinogen or PT INR levels and just uh, push and give the blood and blood products. So and save I, the I, life of the patient. I, I want to ask Pradeep that does this study some way? somehow going to dampen your enthusiasm about uh, administering fibrinogen or cryo? Uh, no, I don't think so, because this study definitely will not change any of our practice patterns. Uh, what I can see in this study, there was a good null hypothesis, Anil, but in fact, the authors do mention in the discussion that uh, they have looked into the previous studies that one third of the trauma patients have fibrinogen less than two. So that is a sort of a hypothetical thought process they had. And we all have dealt with massive bleeding. So there's not much time. So we are racing against the time. So here the assumption has been made that many of these patients, but there were only 33% of them who are sort of hemodynamically unstable in this patient because they took mainly a massive transfusion protocol or systolic blood pressure less than 90th criteria. And only 33% were hemodynamically unstable. So here you wouldn't have much time. So they have got into that hypothetical thought process that fibrinogen anyway will be low and we gave. We gave. So as Anand and Nikhilesh have pointed out, but fibrinogen level should have been somehow uh, captured because that would have given more pragmatic, objective sort of a overview as to whether uh, unblinded, it could have been blinded and then interpreted later whether uh, giving cryoprecipitate was justified in this group. That, that is the sort of a uh, the corrective process that could have happened here. And the authors do mention, but they say but they did not have blinding, much time. Blinding, would you think that in this kind of a study, blinding is, is, is easy? What do you think, Dr. Nikhilesh? Blinding, is it a possible? In, it means obviously people will see. This would be difficult. That. This would be difficult. I'll put it this way. It would be very, very difficult to blind uh, in this. And the uh, method of using sealed envelopes is an old one in terms of randomization, but it's fine. I mean, uh, looking at the setting in which this has been conducted, I guess this is fine. Achha, uh, Ajit, uh, if you are there, yeah. Ajit, I can, I get, yeah, Ajit, I will yeah. just... Yeah, uh, here, here again, allocation concealment was done, you know, obviously. 
it is not yeah, blinding yeah. was not there but the eloquence and concealment was there yeah yeah I, I, I have a question for you ajit but before that i want khushbu to uh, see she wants to add something yes khushbu please yes, go ahead sir uh, the use of uh, bleeding score or any pre diagnostic test was probably not used and also uh, uh, blinding probably to reduce the time of uh, administration as we are questioning an early administration that to within 90 minutes of the admission so logistically it may not be possible to achieve these things and that could be a reason why uh, this was not included as it was included in pilot study true that was included in the pilot study but here because of the logistic reasons it could not be fair enough uh, ajit what i wanted to ask yes. you that the question from dr raj kishor behra from the audience about he wants to know about the fibrinogen concentrate that is available in the market what is their recommendation and how useful they are would you like to take that a uh, fibrinogen concentrate i don't have any i, I never use that okay i, I will i, I never I, pass yeah, on to pradeep yeah, that yeah, pradeep yeah, yeah no yeah. i am not see fibrinogen is a blood bank product which is available i mean you are talking about cryoprospect or fibrinogen what did you ask sorry fibrinogen Fib fibrinogen concentrate concentrate no i am not aware Raj, of its availability here in india i don't know if, if you guys are aware i am not aware of any commercial product available yeah yeah commercially yeah. nowadays fibrinogen levels are available fibrinogen levels in fibrinogen is available sir Okay. Yeah, fibrinogen. We have used in few gynec patients, and uh, it just saved the time. And uh, when uh, when cryo is not available early in the blood bank in the late V hours of the day, then uh, fibrinogen level has worked. So we have used in two patients, and we have got uh, good result. But isolated cryo precipitate is not going to help. It is the whole blood and blood products in a ratio of one is to one is to one. No, Anand, are we talking about? PCC, like no, 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 not PCC. There is fourth one. Isolated, isolated fibrinogen. Isolated fibrinogen. Because someone yes, has put in the chat. Can I? That, that, that is. I just, I just add to that discussion. I just add to that discussion. What really happens is now empirical treatment. You know, giving patient fibrinogen because giving uh, getting fibrinogen level takes time. If you give it empirically. it has not been found to be of major benefit in other bleeding conditions namely the groups that have been studied have been cardiac surgery and the postpartum patients and on the other side if you have a higher levels of fibrinogen they are also known to have a pro inflammatory and a pro coagulant effect so that can even lead to thrombosis infarction and other things now when you are talk talking about it is definitely has got a good uh, you know uh, uh, importance in terms of forming a clot specifically in cases of trauma induced coagulopathy but we need to document that coagulopathy before using it so it is it is very important the timing because fibrinogen is maximally benefited if used early because that is the time when the clot is unstable and it is improve the stability of the clot once the clot has already been stabilized whether by administration of ffp platelets etc etc in the later stages fibrinogen may not have much to do with stabilization of the clot but in fact it may increase the pro thrombotic activity and can 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 be harmful so if not administered early better do not administer fibrinogen at all that's that's that the dictum may be a more practical way of looking upon the things but when we seek a such kind of study when we for to pro, to use early blood products or in, in this in this in such patients there are also some amount of risks involved how do you foresee such risks yes anand i can come to you for that how do you foresee such risks of excessive administration of blood products in such potential trauma bleeding patients definitely too much of blood and blood products can lead to fluid overload can lead to tacho can lead to trolley so you have to tackle such situations tackling one situation leading to the complication and then patient may go on ventilatory support and then again that is a vicious cycle that you have to control Yes, and so that that's that's very important. So Pradeep, so what is the, and, uh, looking Pradeep, at what the, are the common measures? I am asking this for the sake of the benefit of a lot of our students are there who are who have joined us online. So Pradeep, what are the common measures that you follow to prevent such complications of excessive blood product administration? So obviously, when you have a massive transfusion protocol that is uh, triggered or activated. so we need to take uh, measures to prevent the lethal excess so that is most important obviously you have to keep uh, measuring coagulation profile and prevent coagulopathy hypothermia is something that tends to happen and acidosis tends to set in so we need to keep checking the calcium levels 
So and risk of infection also exponentially increases. And as Anand said, the trali, taco, all these are the uh, sort of detrimental uh, after effects of uh, massive transfusion. So we need to be vigilant about all these uh, measures. Hypothermia is very important, which is uh, seldom ignored. So we need to make sure that uh, warmers are there. And calcium also is very important. And strict uh, infection control practices need to be adopted. So I think these are some of the things. And one thing I want to point out in this study, which possibly we have not discussed until now, is the only advantage in this cryoprecipitate group, Anirban, if uh, Kushbu also can uh, certify. So the duration of death was significant, was prolonged, was the... Uh, with regards to duration of death. So they looked at median time of death and that was longer uh, in uh, whether that gives you positive signals, I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, at the end, there was no difference. The numbers didn't... Uh, no, no, mortality, there was no difference, but the time to death, that was delayed. No, no, so, yeah. no, no, another thing, Anirban, you know, another way, you know, theoretically and hypothetically is that, you know, we, we are able to study the viscoelastic property, whatever, you know, the preferably rotamen or some discussions. Like, yeah, you know, we, rotum, we had, we had we discussed it. We, we could yeah, have done we already that. Discussed. Yeah, but, yes, probably we rotamen, then you probably it may help you to reduce, you know, you yeah. can very, you know, judicially select the, the no. amount of blood product and yeah, yeah. for that blood product you can. You can do that. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We, we, we have discussed it, Ajit. Ajit, I want to go to another yeah. question, which has been, which has interesting point, which has been raised by Valij Bharadwaj, is that there is a recommendation by the British Hematologic Society in case of an ongoing to keep the uh, keep the fibrinogen above one point five in, of course, non-pregnant individuals. So now, how valid is this recommendation in our setting, Ajit? What do you think? Uh, about you, you mean to say that keeping over 150 milligram per yeah, exactly. Yeah, so so the, the, that's the thing. Say here, in a few, if you, the patient is not having a bleeding tendency, just based on you know this factor level of which you are giving, there is a harm of you know, there is a risk of in you know, all these you know the you know the transfusion associated you know, injuries are very high. I think in that, that case, it is it is maybe use usage of this viscoelastic property may be the better way to restrict the use. Not just based on, you know, because as you said, in this case also we are empirically given, you know, empirically we are given. So these kind of things are going to increase inflammatory status of the patient, you know, it, it is not, it is probably going to harm and it is not going to make a difference to the patient. So I, I believe maybe, maybe empirically we can say you keep it around 150 and or 1. 150 milligram, but you know, whether it is really going to, for empirical purpose, we are going to be more microscopically, you are going to be a safer side, I mean, it is better that you, you measure this rotum and, um, you know, properties exactly. and then, and so, so in, in a way, in a way, in a way, the researchers are lucky to have escaped with a lot of uh, lesser complications because none of their patients had too much of a involvement of either the kidneys or the other organs. So, uh, I would add to that again. Uh, if you, when we are talking about this, there is one subset which uh, probably should uh, raise our hackers, and that is penetrating injury. Now, penetrating injury subset is one in which uh, actually uh, we doc the trial itself has documented a uh, increased mortality. True. So probably we need it to go further. The other way around. In blunt, in blunt, it the moderate it was slightly less in terms of percentage, whereas it's opposite in case of penetrating. True. In yes, in India, we, do we see a lot of penetrating. We see more blunt, isn't it? Nicolation. In India, I mean, I would think we see more blunt. Yeah, and no, but, but even penetrating. Uh, I'm not aware, actually, uh, I have not uh, read something of that sort in terms of uh, epidemiology of injuries in uh, Indian uh, subcontinent that way. So, uh, if some anybody has the data, they can share that. So, so penetrating injury is something probably it is less common as far as the figures go because. Uh, Blunt injury comes in such big numbers. For one penetrating injury, you might have 10 associated blunt injuries. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. way, they, they, they tend to surpass. But something very interesting is that the, their, their behavior is opposite in terms of the requirement of blood products and their end result. But however, however, once again, said that, Anand, I want to ask you, that mm -hmm. is mortality at 28 days. Of course, they have seen tech six months, also at 12 months. Is a good endpoint to judge their usefulness? 
I don't think so. It's a too uh, high 28 days mortality, the six month mortality in a patient who is bleeding and a trauma patient. The uh, 28 day mortality, the significance is less. True. I would put uh, it this sir, way. I would uh, like to answer Pradeep sir's questions. Probably it was, uh, uh, if I'm uh, correctly saying, sir, as uh, you mentioned, the impact of time to cryopreserved administration was also analyzed. Uh, the patient who received cryoprecipitate in less than 45 minutes were, uh, were analyzed to have higher mortality as compared to group, but there was no control group as there was no placebo given. So timing from uh, in the control group of administration of a particular placebo was not measured and the mortality was not analyzed. But in uh, the randomized... No, but, but anyways, Kushu, it is not possible. So this, those patients mm. would have died anyways. Those who died early because of mm. uh, the severity of bleeding. It cannot be dated that they died because of administration of the 50 project. So those patients who are more severe, they will, of course, follow a different uh, trajectory, which can't be truly corroborated with the 24 hours mortality. So, so if you look into... Yeah, were you telling something, Anand? No. You have finished. No. So mm -hmm. if, if if you see once again that in in this protocol, as again Valish has pointed out, another very important thing that they have active involvement of their hematology colleagues from the blood bank um, in all such cases. That's what he was their practice in the UK. Now, how uh, useful it is? I think that's a very thing that if the hematologist is always a part and parcel of management of such cases, probably that would make a big difference. But again, the availability seems to, this, this, these things may not be simply implementable in our context. What do you think, Nikhilesh? It becomes difficult to have a full-blown hematologist available at V hours and uh, to have availability of so many hematologists. There's a full-blown shortage of it. So I'm not sure whether such a protocol can be practically implemented in terms of, uh, you know, bringing in a hematologist on the team full time. That is one thing. Availability is there only on phone, <laughs> not physically. <laughs> so, so, so that, 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 that no, in, in our that, hospital, Anirban, yeah. I think when we give PCC, you know, we do take their consult and the concurrence most of the time because, because we have hematologists, we talk to them and get them involved. We have to use PCC. So just, just to have good concurrence. Yeah, maybe yes, yes, the hospital maybe it's possible, but at many places it may be difficult. Means if if one follows that protocol, then one may get delayed in administering the blood products. There delay is also not something uh, welcoming at all. So we are running out of the time, and we have very little time left. I'll just add one more thing. I'll just add yeah. one more thing. Uh, you know, uh, we when we dissected the study. We looked at the incidence of severe TBI, and that's where it's a funny statistic, you know. If the incidence of severe TBI was more, then sort of the results of the intervention would have changed. So that needs to be pointed out. That's the only thing probably I'd add to. So probably mild to moderate TBI uh, is, is probably is something which one should look for. One because in severe TBI again things becomes automatically mixed up and clumped up, and so some some odd things may come out which may not have be a relevance. In, in total. So, right. so since we are already running out of time, I will start with Ajit. Ajit, what are, I will go to this with the same question to all of you. I will start with Ajit. So what are your major, if you have to take three important messages on the basis of this study, what would be they? No, yeah, so that's it. The, 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 one of the, one of the major flaw of the study is that, you know, yeah, so this, this has been given empirically, empirically the patient without measuring the, the fibrinogen level, which might have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, which, which might have caused a pro-inflammatory pro state in the patients, you know, which could have affected the, you know, the outcome of the patients. So basically, so this study, in my practice, is not going to make any difference at all. We we never give an empirical, empirical, you know, chronospermate in the patients, all trauma patients who are, you know, when, when major risk of hemorrhage is, when the major hemorrhage risk is happening, we don't give, you know, this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, we won't empirically give, you know, chronospermate to the patient. Yes, Pradeep, key messages that come out from you. From... <coughs> yeah, so this study definitely would not change any of the practices that we are currently adopting on Iban. And uh, for all our trainees, so massive transfusion protocol was a question this time in DNB. Maybe Pushpu would have known. This time DNB, they asked massive. So it is good we understand the concept of what massive transfusion protocol is 
and adopt the all the standard practices to approach a case of a, you know massive transfusion with one is to one is to one i think that would be the first step use tranexamic acid early so do all the basics right before jumping into a research sort of a dimension where you start administering empiric uh, cryoprecipitate so rather you follow the massive transfusion protocol first uh, in a very robust way and then do all the other uh, uh, measures to uh, address the lethal triad issues and then keep checking fibrinogen level and obviously when it is low we have to administer cryoprecipitate so empiric is definitely is shown to at least be harmful in this particular study in penetrating injuries and it may have some procoagulant effect also although it was not shown in this study so i wouldn't take anything from this study anit but although it was a good conducted study and they had a good sort of an hypothesis and a rationale that they embarked on doing this study assuming that fibrinogen levels will be low in the patients when they come with polytrauma that was an assumption they had made uh, so possibly that did not which appear, is more likely uh, to be true you know which is even more likely yeah. to be true but even then yes anand what are your important uh, take home uh, intakes from this study so the three take home messages first of all the isolated cryoprecipitate use is not going to change the outcome it is the team work of whole blood the your ffps your platelets and your cryoprecipitate in uh, in a, as a team following the massive transfusion protocol is going to improve the patient outcome number 2 number 3 uh, most likely is that uh, follow your uh, basics as the sir already mentioned and avoid overuse of your blood products otherwise you will lead to secondary complications and that will change the mortality of the outcome of the patient so this study has not uh, given me something new uh, just uh, isolated cryoprecipitate is not going to change the outcome of the patient nikhilesh uh, a lot of points have been already covered by now but what i would say is probably have a good mhp protocol if possible if you can involve a hematologist uh, that would be great uh, secondly uh, the study does not change any of my uh, practice patterns from what i do usually and ideal would be if i can get a nice fibrinogen turnaround time then possibly uh, use fibrinogen judiciously as and where it would be required where it would be actually beneficial and uh, thirdly of course limit the uh, blood products uh, as much as possible yes yes friends yes. And I have a question also. Let question also tell three take home, and then yes, you can conclude. Sir, I would say uh, that early and empirical. These both things are uh, could not be achieved ideally, uh, and it cannot be generalized because this uh, trial was uh, only uh, concentrated in UK uh, trauma hospitals. So I doubt about the generalizability and practical implementation. Though. Uh, Though there is no significant difference, or though no no benefit have been found uh, by giving the additional three uh, uh, three pools of cryoprecipitate. Second thing, the uh, pre-hospital tranexamic acid, as well as two uh, uh, so two pools of cryoprecipitate, may have a confounding effect on the scores or the taste. Even if we draw it uh, or we go to uh, find that uh, an additional effect with that. so i would say uh, that we need to further understand and study yeah, thank you thank you kushbu all said and done cryoprecipitate or cryo no, no cryoprecipitate would not matter much but definitely in a trauma patient a massive hemorrhagic protocol has to be understood and has to be followed and implemented in its proper sense so that the best results can be obtained without any although the timing of death and the percentage of mortality may not may may be influenced by a lot of other host factors on which blood transfusion or blood product transfusion alone may not be able to achieve all the benefits all we all thank you all for joining us on this wonderful friday evening for this set of rapid journal review hope we will be back again on the, our fourth friday with yet another interesting article for discussion for till then from all of us in jix rapid journal review shubhratri shabar khayat good night thank you thank, thank you everyone thanks nikhilesh thanks anand thanks kushbu thank you team jix thank, thank you team bangalore thank, thank you dr anirvan sir dr pradeep prangopa sir and dr jeet sir thank you all thank you thank you thank you